right? It's great to see some people here in person. Um, and I'm sure we have many people uh, with us virtually online via Zoom. Uh, just do a little plug. Next week, we're having a, a closed session that is an alumni session uh, with just our graduate students. And then the week after that, we will be having a session that is exclusively virtual uh, with Nick Thurston from the UK, who will be speaking uh, the title of this talk is Document Practices, the Art of Propagating Access. Uh, so I heard you all get excited about that one yeah, coming up. Uh, for today, we have Victoria Kane who teaches in the Department of History at Northeastern University. She's the author of Schools and Screens, A Watchful History from MIT Press, 2021, as well as numerous articles and chapters on media, technology, and education. She's the co-author of Life on Display, Revolutionizing U.S. Museums of Science and Natural History from the University of Chicago Press, 2014. And her newest project explores the history and politics of adolescent privacy, and I believe is under consideration with MIT Press as of like three days ago. <laughs> so, yes, <laughs> onward, that's great. So, I bring you Victoria King. All right. Well, Heather, thank you so much for inviting me. Andrew, thank you so much for coordinating all of the logistical details. And thank you guys for showing up at 5 p.m. on a Thursday. Um, as Heather mentioned, I'm here today to talk about this new book project, uh, or I guess new book, it's left the project stage, Schools and Screens, um, which is a history of efforts to reform elementary and secondary education in the US through educational screen media. So it's funny that we're sitting right across from Justin Wright's office, because in some ways, I feel like I have done the prehistory to a lot of what he talks about and thinks about. Um, tonight, I'm going to share some of the findings uh, from the research I did for this book, describe two case studies, um, and conclude with a reflection on how the book relates to our current moment. So I started thinking about the history of educational technology in US schools a few years ago, um, because the gap between rhetoric and reality seemed so enormous to me. As soon as common schools were established in the United States in the early 19th century, people started talking about ways to improve them through technology. And that kind of talk only grew louder and more persistent in the 20th century. Um, and yet, despite all of this emphasis and effort on introducing new technologies to make schools better, it actually took a really long time for schools to embrace and integrate the same screen media technologies that had long permeated the rest of society. So the question of why were they so slow, that piqued my interest. Um, and I was very lucky to start this project just as a whole wave of historians of media and technology were beginning to wrestle with different aspects of this history. Um, I also benefited enormously from new digital access to publications on non-theatrical media. And this is my little plug for the Media History Digital Library. If people haven't used it yet, you need to. So um, the Internet Archive was the other sort of wonderful you know, repository that you guys should all check out, particularly if you are interested in the early history of like, personal computing. Um, so I started pawing through these online resources, but I also started going into school board records and education journals and all kinds of archival materials from the early 1930s when schools first started using film on a more regular basis. And then I kept going all the way up through the early 2000s when nearly every school in the United States was fully, if, you know, connected with some fragility, um, but fully connected to the internet. I also read, as a starting point, a lot of Larry Cuban. Uh, Larry Cuban is a terrific historian of education who wrote several books about classroom technologies in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, and he's really the guy who created the master narrative of the history of educational technology. And according to Cuban, um, the story of ed tech is really cyclical. Efficiency obsessed school administrators foisted new technological tools on teachers. Um, the technology was poorly designed for existing classroom norms. 
Teachers had little incentive to change those norms. Teachers refuse to use the technology. The technology gets relegated to storeroom shelves to die. Rinse and repeat. Um, and he makes this argument that this happens with a whole bunch of different kinds of machines. And in fact, those of us who have either been students or teachers may have seen that cycle play out ourselves, where the like shiny new tool comes in and then it kind of works, but kind of doesn't, and then eventually it sort of goes away to some library shelf and nobody ever sees it again. So Cuban's take is actually very persuasive, uh, but his scholarly interests were very much located in the specifics of classroom teaching and in school infrastructure. He's a historian of education who's really interested in classroom culture. And when he was writing these books, his archival base was very limited. So I started thinking, I was like, you know what? There gotta be other ways to answer this question um, of why schools are so slow to adopt and make effective use of screen media. Um, and I kept thinking, well, you know, expanding the frame of this research and really digging into different sets of archival materials might help shed new light on this situation. And that is, I'm hoping, uh, the contribution that I'm making here. Uh, what I found was that there were four really pivotal debates over school screen media. Um, and these debates, the tensions that people got all heated up over, um, often slowed schools' embrace of these tools. I mean, sometimes they actually hastened schools' integration of new screen media technologies. But either way, it was these four tensions that were pivotal in shaping when and how and why schools adopted screen media technologies. Um, so here are the research findings, and I'm just going to go over them one by one. Um, first, I would argue uh, that tensions over race and racism were pivotal in shaping the history of screenings in schools. People like to talk about technology as race blind, even though as scholars of media, you know it's anything but. Um, and yet school screens were also anything but. Progressive educational reformers often looked to school screens to help loosen the Gordian knots of racism and the multitude of ills that it caused. Uh, at the same time, particularly in the 50s and 60s, um, as well as later on, Conservative white politicians and school administrators also made heavy use of screen media technology to justify and often reinforce school segregation. Despite reformers' hopes that school media technologies would help to overcome the quandary of race, school screens usually exacerbated race-based educational inequities uh, instead of eliminating them. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more deeply about that in the Q&A. Another theme that came up repeatedly is that the history of school screens is a history of the ongoing distrust of educators. Skepticism about educators' abilities was a major impetus for the introduction of classroom tech. At the same time, when classroom technology did make its way into American schools, Americans often wondered whether teachers were even competent, competent enough to handle these tools. Um, so debates over school screens were usually debates over exactly what teachers in schools could or should do, and also whether visual media technologies could better accomplish those tasks than actual human beings. A third thought was that the history of school screens is a history of the growing influence of private funding in public schools. From the 1930s through the 1960s, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, other major philanthropic institutions, they initiated and they propped up experiments in educational media development and use. And you'll certainly see this in some of the case studies that I offer later on. Um, as a result, these foundations wielded outside influence over the politics and practices surrounding school screens. But it was really in the late 1970s, 1980s, and early 1990s that for-profit corporations became really powerful players in promoting the school use of media technology. 
and the lobbying, donation, and marketing efforts of these corporations truly expanded the use of screens in schools, but also helped to shape the way that education was implemented in public institutions in this country. A final discovery was the way and the importance of tensions over the appropriate role of screens in citizenship education. Schools have long been charged in the United States with preparing youngsters for engaged, responsible participation in an overlapping set of political, economic, and social communities. But what exactly made students good citizens and what exactly they required from schools to get there, that was hardly a matter of consensus. Screens just raised the temperature on already heated discussions about citizenship education, especially given Americans' long-standing anxieties about what screens did to kids, right? People were worried back in the 1930s, just as they are today, that screens are going to unleash unpredictable desires or reduce youngsters to unquestioning passivity. So experiments with and debates about media technology for schools often revolved around how not only how they would influence youth, I mean, there's a lot of moral panic, right, that gets associated with this, but it's really thinking about the ways that they influence youth as part of the broader polity, thinking about how they influence future citizens. Um, so those were four major tensions that came up in every decade I study over and over and over again. Um, and those were, the, as you can see, I'll show you my little uh, table of contents. I end up organizing the book kind of around the debates chronologically. Um, and you'll see those four tensions in each chapter. But in addition to considering what shapes the trajectory of screen media technology in school, I also began to think about who was engaging in these debates. Um, you know, Cuban had talked a lot about school administrators. Those are, you know, the anxious, well-meaning villains um, in his narrative. But who were the reformers that were like pushing screen media on schools? Did teachers embrace them? Were parents excited about them? What about industry writ large? Um, and what I found is that these reformers could generally be or sorted into three groups. Um, First, you had advocates for what I call civic spectatorship. And I'm going to talk about that group today. Um, they were one of the earliest coalitions pushing screen media into schools. Progressive, politically liberal educators who believed that schools had a responsibility to promote civic engagement and what we might now describe as social justice. Um, they saw schools as the engines for reconstructing society in a better form. And from the 1930s on, this group of reformers argued that we need screens in schools in order to give students the opportunity to practice skills that will help them navigate a civic realm increasingly organized around screen media. A second group pushing screens into schools was made up of men and women, but mostly men, uh, who believed that technology provided and managed by experts was the key to improving educational quality. These technocrats promised that schools would modernize outdated educational practice, scale high quality teaching and ease longstanding educational inequities, and that they would do so at little to no cost to taxpayers. So a lot of the rhetoric you hear coming out of Silicon Valley now, that is presaged by like, our gentleman at the Ford Foundation in the 1950s, making grandiose promises about educational television and its powers. And the last set of cheerleaders um, and advocates for reforming schools through screens are people who are actually in the business of producing and selling media and technology to schools, as well as their allies in journalism and government. These are the people who directly stand to profit from screens, whether it's financially or professionally. And these three groups coexisted. Uh, they often overlapped. Each one was involved in major experiments with school screens over the course of the 20th century. And all of them seized moments of perceived educational and social crisis. 
which is pretty easy because American schools, if you listen to the media, are always in crisis. There is always a crisis going on in education, um, whether it's moral panic or economic depression or domestic unrest or international conflict or de declining SAT scores. Like there's always a crisis somewhere and always technology is going to be the thing that saves us. Um, so the book's chapters are, as I mentioned, organized chronologically. Um, and in them, I analyze the most, what I see as several as mo the most notable experiments who are, that are initiated by these reformers. Um, and I have to examine and analyze the debates that result from their work. Okay. So today what I wanna do is I wanna go over two case studies, um, two curriculum experiments that illustrate some of the tensions that I just walked you through. One is a success story um, and it takes place in the 1930s. And the other is a cautionary tale uh, from the late 60s, early 70s. But both focus on progressive reformers, progressive politically and progressive pedagogically interested in using screen media as a way to promote civic engagement um, that is very much of the moment uh, that they are operating in. Uh, so my first story takes place in the 1930s as a very loose coalition of educators and psychologists and documentarians, filmmakers uh, who see you know, activism through the realm of film um, as their uh, so they begin to push schools to embrace popular cinema as a tool for citizenship training and political engagement. Um, these reformers uh, include film appreciation advocates like Edgar Dale, uh, William Lewin, educators uh, like NYU education professor Alice Kaliher, uh, social activists like Mary Losey, who basically got kicked off the March of Time because everybody thought she was a communist to her. Um, and they were all interested in promoting a constellation of visual, analytical, and social skills that I describe in the book as civic spectatorship. Now, the term is a borrowed one. Um, it was coined by photography theorist Ariella Azule to describe the way that spectatorship of visual imagery can actually create new social, political, and ethical relationships among the viewers and the view. Um, and communication scholars Robert Harriman and John Lewis Lucades elaborated on Azalea's ideas in the American context, suggesting that in the United States, in the 20th century United States, civic spectatorship is the equivalent of literacy when it comes to civic engagement. It contributes just as much to share political discourse. And to me, the term very neatly sums up what this kind of motley crew of reformers hoped to accomplish. They believed that schools were in the business of preparing students for citizenship in this wild, woolly, liberal, increasingly media-saturated democracy. And so they argued that schools had a responsibility to prepare students for this new world, um, they had to help students rehearse the skills that would be necessary to parse through visual propaganda, cinematic arguments, um, the visual media that was beginning to splash itself across every movie screen, every newsstand, you know, every billboard. Um, and they wanted them to not only have these skills, but to be able to apply them in a way that would help them engage constructively with civic life. So these reformers, that's, that's their idea. That's their ultimate ambition and their focus. But actually how that translates into a K through 12 classroom, uh, that's a whole different deal. Um, so they consistently and somewhat radically for the time argue that the best way for schools to accomplish this lofty goal is to show popular films in class, uh, often paired with news articles and short social science readings. And they want kids to watch these films or shorts based on these films, do these readings, and then discuss the sociological and psychological and political dilemmas that the films raise. It's, it sounds very contemporary and therefore very natural to us, but let me tell you during the 1930s, this is like 
you know, people were were a little shocked with this idea. Um, and the films they suggested using were wide ranging. Uh, they included dramas like Cavalcade or Alice Adams or Captain's Courageous, uh, documentaries like Joris Ivan's Spanish Earth, mm -hmm. and lots of newsreels uh, like The March of Time. Now, reformers, uh, they were ambitious, but they were also extremely practical, um, and many of them politically savvy. And they recognized just how large films loomed in the lives of the students they hoped to reach, especially during the Depression, right? And everybody's saving their nickels to go to the movies during the Depression. Um, and as one reformer, Alice Kaliha wrote in 1936, quote, the life of the American adolescent is colored markedly by his movie experiences. So schools have an obligation to acknowledge the inherent power of the photo play and turn it to good use. So part of it is practical, but part of it is deeply psychological. Um, they believe, they have this conviction that films one to punch of visual information and then emotion prepare students to engage more openly with the world that surrounds them. As Edgar Dale put it, a book dealing with the scientific mechanics of soil erosion may leave us cold, but a film like The Plow That Broke the Great Plains stirs us. So through the practice of civic spectatorship of films, reformers hoped students would begin to deliberate empathetically and collectively about issues ranging from, as Dale put it in 1938, quote, the abolition of war, to a new point of view regarding crime and punishment, to the more satisfactory distribution of wealth, to a deeper insight into the problems of democratic government, to an understanding of the Negro problem, end quote. Educators were actually quite enthusiastic about the idea of using popular film in school. Teachers were into this idea. Um, they actually stood in line. There's this amazing petition um, that someone gathers in 1930 about teachers who want to use popular film in school. Um, and 100, 100, excuse me, 1,200 people signed their name to this one like local New Haven petition. I mean, teachers are all in. But district administrators originally, you know, they initially resist on financial grounds. It's the depression. They can barely cover teacher salaries, you know, much less electrify their rural schools and deal with, you know, rental fees for dramas and documentaries and the projector purchases. And there were cultural obstacles too. Older principals often forbade screening modern motion pictures at school on moral grounds. Even when you know they passed muster, popular films tended to be too long, only peripherally relevant, and quite expensive. Uh, film exhibitors had zero interest in having films exhibited in schools because they saw schools very legitimately as a threat to their business model. You can show movies at noon in the cafeteria. Why would you go to a film and actually pay money to see it? So Dale and Kaliher and all of these other reformers, they're determined, though, to push this notion of civic spectatorship. So they go hat in hand to the Rockefeller Foundation and to a few other foundations. Um, and they begin to negotiate with studios for the right to excerpt and use films in the classroom. Um, they help districts develop relationships with local theaters to allow students to see second run films in the middle of the day. They generate lots and lots of curriculum, sometimes standalone units for like history or English classes, sometimes whole courses that use film excerpts and associated texts to prompt student discussion of social and political values and relationships in modern American culture. Uh, and here actually, there we go. Um, so scholars like Craig Friedel and Eric Smooten and Lisa Rabine and Katie Day Good have also done a little bit of work touching on these curriculum in various places. And you know, we all agree, it's really obvious when you look at the actual stuff. I mean, these curricula are extraordinarily progressive. They would give a lot of Republican members of Congress deep on Utah today, um, both pedagogically and politically. Um, 
you know, they're talking about uncomfortable civic issues, uh, economic inequality, racial discrimination, violence. Um, so for instance, uh, Dale and Oliver both developed curriculums that respectively used the film Fury, a 1936 Spencer Tracy film, featuring the near lynching of a falsely accused prisoner. And they use it as an entree into the discussion of the injustice of you know, political um, and the justice system and the epidemic of racial terror lynchings in the American South. Now, these kinds of curricular units were a big hit with urban educators whose politics leaned left. Um, and by the mid 1930s, some 10,000 classes and groups relied on Dale's guides to promote civic spectatorship in and out of school. Kaliher's human relations film series curriculum enjoyed similar popularity by the end of the decade and was used in several thousand schools. Those are just a couple examples. So this is you know, increasingly adopted. And yet the tensions that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk frequently slowed schools' adoption and use of such curricula and film more generally. Um, industry advocates and administrators uh, objected to the political undertones of these curricula. Conservatives expressed reservation over the Rockefeller support for the curricula, uh, reservations that would eventually take fuller form in the investigations of the Reese Committee, uh, launched in the late 1940s and coming up to bear fruit in the early 1950s. There was widespread skepticism about teachers' abilities uh, to handle these films. Many school boards looked askance at the pedagogy that was promoted um, on which training and civic spectatorship depended and proclaimed that students were never going to be able to control students or teachers were never going to be able to control student discussion mm -hmm. about such fraught topics like, oh, it's too risky, it's too politically dangerous. Um, what happens if the students get out of control after they've been addled by films? Educators themselves were sometimes a little bit wary as well they should have been. They knew that controversial films or juvenile sort of experiments and posing and discussion could skid off course and that held real peril for them, resulting in scolding, official inquiries, even job loss. Um, Edgar Dale himself, this leading classroom film advocate, you know, he's a professor at Ohio State University. He got swept up in the wake of a 1939 red hunting investigation by the trustees at his own university. Um, and he was required to testify as to whether or not his approach to movie viewing had resulted in student support for strikers in Columbus. Um, now we can also see the way that contests over citizenship hampered the adoption of films in many schools. As global politics darkened at the end of the 1930s, films used in schoolrooms assumed newly threatening civic dimensions. Radio was propagandist's preferred instrument in the 1930s, but Europe's rising dictators made extensive use of films' political potential, commissioning hundreds of school films to prop up their regimes. And American parents, educators, and politicians were really worried that these films were going to leak into American classrooms in one way or another, and that the practices of civic spectatorship would just be no match for the power of this insidious imagery. Um, and such fears really tempered enthusiasm for the kind of emotionally driven discussion oriented pedagogy that these reformers were promoting. Rather than encourage open-ended discussion, declared Maine High School Principal Robert Roachford White, educators should take a firm hand and use school films to, quote, inspire a democratic philosophy in the personal creed of American youth and assist in the formation of a patriotic spirit of national unity. In other words, Roachford White explained, uh, they needed to provide students with clear and explicit instruction in how to act, think, and be American. And to him, open-ended discussion, you know, that was not part of that. Um, once the war began, explicit and widespread desire to promote the war effort further dampened schools' enthusiasm 
or exploratory discussions of sometimes ambiguous film messages. But once the war wound down, civic spectatorship really rebounded. Um, new film-based curricula drew very heavily on the work that had been generated in the 30s by these media reformers, the practices and the principles that had been espoused by Dale and Felicher and all of these other kind of interwar education advocates. Um, and both American educators and the newly organized educational film industry adopted critical analysis and open-ended group discussion as standard viewing practice in the 1940s. Because to many Americans, cultivating these practices really stand, stood in stark contrast to the education that had resulted in totalitarian regimes, the repression that they associated with German and Russian schooling. So critical viewing and group discussion seemed to embody and reach toward the kind of post-war democratic ideals of free expression and tolerance and rational compromise and consensus building. Um, so the work of these interwar reformers that I write about actually offers something as a prelude to the Cold War embrace of televised and post-viewing discussions that Anna McCarthy writes about in The Citizen Machine. That's not a 50s phenomenon. That gets established earlier. Um, indeed, by the end of the 1940s, there is broad agreement among teachers, parents, and policymakers that civic spectatorship represents a powerful social technology capable of producing new and constructive modes of citizenship. So that's my success story. Um, yay, progressives. But uh, educators' commitment to this kind of viewing and pedagogical practice, it really ebbs and flows quite a bit over the next several decades. But it remains this sort of undercurrent in discussions of school screens um, among champions of progressive pedagogical ideals, and really sort of you know, everybody, just like on people's radar. Um, and in the mid-1960s and early 1970s, uh, this kind of pedagogy, again, fluoresces. It becomes enormously popular once again as educators and activists seek to meet the era's challenges by teaching future citizens to analyze and discuss new visual narratives critically, again, in experimental multimedia curricula that is sponsored by foundations and universities. Um, and it's this that brings me to the second case study. In this era, um, the sort of mid 60s to early 70s, the single best known uh, curricular experiment was a curriculum called Man, a Course of Study. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. Not really like, you know, pinged at your generation, but I remember it from when I was a kid, actually. Um, and I'm old, but I'm not that. Um, so Man of Course of Study, which was nicknamed MAKOS, was conceived in 1962 and launched in 1969. And MAKOS was a fifth grade social studies curriculum that was created by psychologists and social scientists and educators over at Harvard University. And it was one of an alphabet soup of curriculum reform projects that flooded American schools after Sputnik's 1957 launch, Americans got completely freaked out that we were behind the Russians and they were like, oh, we have to reinvent education. I know, let's launch a thousand different curricular ships. And this was one of those ships. It was created with money from the National Science Foundation and also a series of private foundations. And this curriculum was intended, like the others of this era, to provide students with disciplinary grounding and critical thinking skills that would equip them for more advanced study of subjects considered essential to the United States of war against the Soviets. Now, like other federally sponsored curricula produced in this era, MAKOS made extensive use of screen media. By the 1960s, educators of all stripes, from you know, the top dog superintendent to the crustiest in-class educator or principal, everybody was embracing screen media. It was new, it was essential, it was how you proved you were sort of a modern school. Um, 
And the designers of MAKOS believe that film would enable fifth graders to do things that they otherwise might not be capable of doing, to grapple with sophisticated evidence through close observation and thoughtful interpretation. They might not have been able to read or understand a really difficult primary source document, but surely everybody can look, everybody can observe, everybody can analyze. That's the thinking behind this. So they created a curriculum around 16 short documentaries that depicted different animal and human communities. And the idea behind these documentaries were for students to act as sociobiologists and anthropologists. They would watch footage, then they would ask questions and develop and test hypotheses based on this footage. And then they would draw conclusions based on their hypotheses and a lot of back and forth discussion. And in this way, declared one Makos designer, students would learn what he called, quote, a methodology of thinking, at least thinking in a social science way. But as historian of science, Erica Malam has pointed out, the Makos team believed these films actually offered far more than disciplinary training. Um, the Makos team hoped that guided viewing and discussion, so sort of civic spectatorship, but 30 years later, of these films would shape students' self-concept and social character, and would ultimately alter their way of being in the community and the polity and the world. There was the visual side of it. They hoped that observing and analyzing visual evidence would give students practice in the kind of critical measured reasoning upon which they believed democracy depended. Um, but they also, again, and here's that emotional they also really hoped that these fifth grade American students would identify deeply with the indigenous subsistence cultures that were depicted in these films. And by identifying with the kids they saw on the screens who lived radically different lives than their own, that students would develop empathy and appreciation for human commonalities. Mako's team member and psychologist Richard Jones neatly summed up the team's ambitions. Quote, if these objectives can be realized, then both the future scholar and the future citizen are served. Think of the contemporary social ills that could not exist if a generation of Americans could be taught to identify in heart, mind, and stomach with the human species. Cold War confrontations abroad and civil rights battles at home lent these endeavors a terrible urgency. Raising students' consciousness about their shared humanity seemed to these curriculum designers the only antidote to atomic peril and the only solution to racial violence. Swayed by Marshall McLuhan's portentous intonations, Mavis planners believed that their films would help students to stretch their senses and glimpse the global village of which they were a part. So the ambitions of Mako's designers were very similar to those of our progressive educational reformers in the 30s. But the films, the actual material they rely on to awaken this kind of feeling and to help people practice the visual and analytical skill, radically different. Rather than rely on excerpts from Hollywood epics or the March of Time, Mako's course designers, they're using hardcore anthropological and biological footage. They rely on ethnologists to create films of salmon and herring gulls and baboons, um, as well as the culture and lifestyle of the San people of the Kalahari Desert and the Netsilic uh, people based in Nunavut, Canada. And the shorts that they produced looked and sounded radically different from most classroom films. Uh, they were shot in color, for one thing, and they offered almost no on-screen narration. So if you go to YouTube and you look at like many mid-century films from this period where they're telling you like, you know, smoke pot or whatever, you know, it's like these stentorian overtones, the narrator is going on. That's not what's happening here. You hear waves, you hear birds, you hear wind, you hear people talking to each other in languages that you don't understand. Um, and the reason for that is that that mellifluous commentary, the curriculum designers believe, they, they thought kids to sleep. They thought kids would just sort of check out and accept whatever the narrator said as right. They wanted students to really listen 
and focused and engaged. And so students would, they would lean forward as they tried to decipher what was happening on these screens. It was actually a very elegant solution to anxieties about passive spectatorship. These films challenge viewers with little exposure to subsistence cultures. Um, students watch children their own age hunt birds by stoning them to death. Uh, they would watch men harpooning seals in a fishing hole. Uh, they watch, and this is something I remember from fifth grade. I don't know if any of the other uh, older people in this room saw that, but like there was a scene where um, kids ate the seal eye. It was like a delicacy. Um, and, and, you know, so you got to watch little kids like delightedly chomping away on this, on this seal eye. And it was, and, and, you know, wrapping your head around that as a 10 year old was a big act. Students have learned about Netflix culture before they encountered these films with readings and games and projects um, so that they could contextualize the acts, but the images did retain their emotional intensity. And this was quite intentional. Curriculum designers were committed to what they believed as honest presentation of culture. And they hoped these scenes would plunge students and teachers into deep conversation about the foundations of human culture, behavior, and morality. Such scenes, wrote the curriculum lead developmental psychologist Jerome Bruner, they forced students to, quote, rethink or reorganize the moral judgments and the role taking in which they themselves were engaged. So when the course was finally launched in 1969, educators and psychologists hailed it as a triumph. I mean, it's not often that a fifth grade social science curriculum course makes the New York Times. But this one did, it was like all over the mainstream media as well as the educational press. People praised its innovative design, its multimedia strategy, its unflinching examination of topics that certainly had not been addressed in elementary school social studies prior to. Um, and course, evaluation, course evaluators had special praise for the film, reporting that they quote, worked a magic all their own and quote, drew students into a shared experience with the people show. But as the course began to filter into American schools, critics also emerged. Evangelicals, uh, John Bircher, social conservatives, began to stage aggressive protests against this curriculum at school board and community meetings. So at all of the hubbub over CRT right now, you can think about that, but you know, 45 years earlier. Um, protesters re regularly cited the films as the course's single most objectionable element. Uh, like I said, Mako's designers had seen these films as like honest biological and cultural records that would prompt critical thinking and thoughtful discussion. Conservative protesters, on the other hand, denounced these films as you know, forms of X-rated decadence that would lead to psychological damage and classroom anarchy. Um, a mounting scene in one of the Herring Gull films provoked almost a riot at a community meeting in a suburb west of Denver uh, because parents believed that showing sexual behavior, even if that behavior were occurring in the bird world, um, ran close to sodomy and was downright immoral. Um, much of the criticism centered on students' physical and psychic reaction to the film's more intense scenes, uh, which critics described as nauseating, violating, and shocking. Is there any gain in giving young children pictures in which they see animals being skinned alive? Asked one opponent. Um, Protesters definitely did not trust teachers to guide students through this content. Conservatives argued that the average teacher would either bungle discussion of children's reactions or refuse to address the reactions altogether, leaving students unclear about what to think and heavily traumatized to boot. Critics also opposed the film's quiet message of cultural relativism and what they called one worldism as California-based Makos critic John Steinbacher called it. By presenting Netflix culture in straightforward terms, 
The film suggested that the behaviors that deviated from middle-class American Christian norms were possible, tolerable, and sometimes even admirable. Um, and to conservatives confronting the chaotic culture of the early 1970s, presenting these alternatives as valid seemed treacherous, uh, unpatriotic even. They rejected the ecstatic humanist vision that Mako's designers had articulated and that they had hoped this media would help students realize. And they scorned the ideologies and skills that Mako's films were intended to promote. This was not the kind of spectatorship that classrooms should engender, uh, these opponents argued. And this was not the kind of citizenship that schools should seek to inculcate. So debate over the curriculum became so heated. And again, let me remind you, this is a fifth grade social studies curriculum, right? It became so heated that this guy, uh, Republican Congressman John Conlon, took the matter to the floor of the US House of Representatives, uh, where he demanded that Congress itself ban the curriculum from American schools. Uh, according to Conlon, Makos and its films functioned as, quote, cultural shock techniques, and that they were designed to persuade children to reject the values, beliefs, religions, and national loyalties of their parents and American society. Um, the films, he argued, had no place in the public schools of America. So the vociferous reaction to this course permanently crippled not only Makos' sales, but also federal funding for classroom media production for several years thereafter. Um, after Conlon brought the attention, or this curriculum to Congress's attention, uh, NSF director, National Science Foundation director Guy Stever, he backed off. I mean, he promised to withhold funds from any pre-college science course curriculum development or implementation until a special panel could review all NSF efforts. Um, and what this meant in practice was that these kinds of bold multimedia experiments simply became unaffordable. Um, private publishers had zero interest in sinking the money in to create elaborate films and multimedia, um, at least until, you know, gaming came about um, and you know, computer software made it profitable again. Um, and without federal funds to prop up this kind of sophisticated multimedia curriculum development, it simply fell into disuse. So what can we take away from these two very different moments in the history of school screens? Well, in both instances, um, the curriculums were animated by educators' concern about racism in the 1930s about anxieties over lynching, in the 1960s, uh, an effort to sort of support civil rights in an arm's length way, um, an effort to really get students to think of themselves as members of a larger human community. And they motivated the use of screen media in particular. Um, educators believed that the emotional and experiential elements of visual screen media would enable students to tap into a kind of immediate empathy that other forms of media simply would not um, elicit. And as a result, they hoped that this kind of film um, or film strips or other kinds of visual media would really help a generation of students relate to one another in new ways. In both instances, the question of who was funding school screens was a major point of concern and contention. As I mentioned, the production and purchase of high quality screen media and technology often required resources far beyond what an individual district could muster. And so experiments with school screens, uh, both getting them into the schools and then generating the curriculum that was used this really required either philanthropic or federal funding. But the American education system is intensely local. And over the course of the 20th century, communities, communities vacillated between a commitment to run local schools without intervention from outsiders um, and a desire to be modern and to adopt media products, technologies, and curricula that was produced and sponsored by, say, the Rockefeller Foundation or the National Science Foundation. 
um, often in conjunction with broader industry. But it meant screens became political rights. Um, and so questions over the appropriate role of both philanthropy and government in media production that just amplified these controversies. Um, in both of these case studies, reformers attempted to use film in classrooms to teach students new ways of relating, relating to screen media for the purposes of citizenship, uh, to help them cultivate both the skills and the selves that they thought was important uh, for American citizenship in an age of screens. But again, in both eras, almost immediately, questions arose as to what kind of skills and selves schools should actually be trying to construct and whether or not educational media that was being used for that purpose could actually accomplish it. As the anxious debates over these two sets of very different classroom films make clear, pictorial screen media pressed hard on the tenuous boundaries between emotion and reason, body and mind, self and society. Blurring these boundaries within the carefully guarded confines of the classroom, unnerved parents, administrators, and even educators. And as a result, in the 1930s, educators, even those who embraced the idea of using popular films in their classrooms, often <clears throat> backed away from films that had ambiguity about where national loyalties lay. In the instance of Makos, the perception that these films were blurring these same boundaries resulted in a political firestorm that was too hot for any curriculum to survive. The history of school screens is ultimately a history of changing ideas about screen media's impact on students. It's a history of evolving arguments about who should control classrooms. And most of all, the eight decade struggle to determine the proper relationship between schools and screens is a history of ongoing disagreement about schools' purpose in US society. Now, as they've done for nearly a century, educators today still debate how and if schools can use screens to minimize rather than reinforce existing inequities. Mm -hmm. They ask themselves to what extent disrespect for teachers is driving or shaping future school plans for screens, and whether or not money invested in technology might be better spent elsewhere, um, like on the teaching staff. And everybody still wants to know how screens can you know, be used to promote positive, positive civic engagement and how to prepare students for citizenship in an even more complex digital age. Preparing students for citizenship in a media-mad, media-made democracy remains an urgent task today. In an era of media convergence, this is enormously challenging. I mean, you know that yourselves, right? Educators, they're struggling with data breaches and questions of digital surveillance. Pundits and parents argue about schools' ethical and legal responsibilities um, when it comes to things like racist memes or screen addiction or cyberbullying, other troubling aspects of school life in the digital age. And the problem of how to confront misinformation uh, sobers even the most optimistic educator. Uh, in 2016, for instance, the Stanford History Education Group released a report announcing that, quote, young people's ability to reason about the information on the computer screen can be summarized in one word, bleak. Uh, without more attention to civic reasoning skills, the group predicted, American society's shift to screens would deeply damage democracy. And this report was completed two months before Trump was elected. So in this contemporary moment of profound fragmentation, much of it taking place over media, um, part of me wonders whether we should be going the same route, uh, encouraging the same kind of classroom pedagogy that our depression era advocates of civic spectatorship and the Makos folks encourage, slow down, carefully or analyze and discuss all manner of media in small diverse groups with an eye towards considering how to use this media for productive civic ends. As we all know, there are considerable risks to doing this. It requires trust in educators, skill in guiding discussion. Um, you know, and discussion can seem 
real challenging right now, perilous even. Um, and yet classroom screens still guarantee a physical place in which people of varying backgrounds can gather to practice civic behavior and discussion in a country that is badly in need of common ground. So that's my talk. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if I can pick this up with two questions. Go for it. Um, one is, wow, these, like a lot of things you said really resonated with a lot of the material we've been reading in our graduate class, right? 801 Media Transition. Um, just read anymore. Cool, and so we just read an excerpt from the Pain Fun study oh, from great. the movie Delinquency and Crime, Excellent. which is from is that the Bloomer? Bloomer, yeah, other love it. 1933. And I was struck by the Fury, I believe, was from 36. It right? was. And I was wondering if the um, first case study was specifically of a post Pain Fun study moment where there's a kind of like, oh, we've seen how movies are bad and how these studies were popularized in our movie and children as if they had shown the unequivocally that this don't harm each other. But here's the flip side. I'm wondering if that discourse is sort of happening or that dialogue, and also to what extent the film industry is like on board with this as like great PR for them, right? As, as opposed to some of the earlier publicity before the production code administration yeah. set up in 1934, which we're also talking about. Um, so that's my first question. Yeah. And my second question is just about sort of cost efficiency and economic issues with uh, the, the Make Us project. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know if, uh, you know, if these films were rented, for example, as opposed to being purchased. Um, and, it seems like there's a way, this is a little incoherent, but I'm obsessed with film strips. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the, and there are a lot of film strips in. <laughs> and we can talk about this. Oh my God. Film <laughs> strips. But, but with film strips, once you buy them, um, and so they, they, they're not, they're, I don't know if everyone knows these, but they go through a projector one frame at a time. And there's a cassette or a phonograph album to go with it that plays along with audio, right? And once you buy it, as a teacher in a public school classroom, you can just put it in the closet and whip it out whenever you want. And the school board doesn't have to keep track of it in the way they would with like rental materials or you know, getting a new curriculum every year. And so it means that you can have your say creationist film strip in the closet or your or your evolution like, radical right? like like black panther film strip. Right. And exactly. some of it coexist. Like exactly. it was just, or just sex yeah. ed, you know, sex education was a huge thing. Which actually so, the make us curriculum was often used. Repurposed for oh, right. we talked about that in the birds and stuff with the herring goals. So, but anyway, if you sell your materials, you have initial controversy perhaps, and then you don't because it just sort of goes subterranean. So, I'm wondering, like, are they sustaining controversy because they keep re you know publicizing it so that more people buy it and or subscribe or what you know, whatever? So, two sort of very different questions that you can thought of. So, let me start with the first question, and it's a terrific question because you're right. The, the 1930s is this like watershed moment where people, I mean, because the movies are becoming so enormously popular and such a critical sort of economic engine, they're transforming the American imagination, American life, and people are just wondering what does, all, what does this all mean? Um, you know, and particularly with pain, what does this mean for our kids? Edward Dale actually is one of the authors on the pain fund studies. And he, his little like very accessible reader's guide, like how to watch the movies. Um, you know, this helps to kick off the film appreciation movement, which is an effort to use movies, sort of analyze them again for constructive purposes. And a lot of the people that I was talking about were very much affiliated with this film appreciation moment. Um, now, film appreciation had, it was like a big spectrum. Some people were like, we're just going to watch movies of Charles Dickens and use this as a way to explore the novel. Um, and some people were a little bit more politically radical, like Dale himself, who starts out a little bit more conservative, but by the end of the 30s, he's like, burn it all down. You know, he's, he is much more um, committed to the idea of using films to engage students in what, um, sometimes in the educational world gets called social, social reconstruction. So the idea that schools are gonna reconstruct society in a better image of itself. Um, and he in, is often involved in meaningful debate um, and pressure on Hollywood. There's a famous debate he gets into with Martin Quigley, who is the editor of uh, the, the Motion Picture, Motion Picture, Picture Herald. Herald. 
Yeah, and I actually almost threw um, one of the headlines up where it's like they're having this debate. And actually, maybe I can even, I think I might have included one. Yes, now come educators with plea for films of social insight. So in some ways, industry is embracing this when it is convenient for them. Like they love themselves from Alice Kaliber because they see her as acceptable. She depersonalizes and depoliticizes a lot of this. She's really interested in the psychological angle and the idea of introducing students to film in order to help them psychologically adjust to the challenges of modernity. She's got this very forward thinking way of helping students tangle with their own identities and think about their own position in society and how that could be changed over time. But other reformers, um, Dale among them, Mary Losey, who edits and creates a whole film curriculum that goes with the March of Time, um, which is crazy town radical. I mean, like it's it's really funny. They hire William Lewin at the March of Time to create one film curriculum, and then they hire Mary Losey. And if you read them in context, it's they don't match um, politically or pedagogically. But you know, those folks are pushing industry to create classroom films and to create films that are what one might think of as more socially engaged um, to promote and push issues of what we would now call social justice and what they then called social insight. So industry saw this kind of group of reformers in a couple of different ways. In some ways they were like, you annoying Socratic horsefly, get out of here, stop talking at us. We're gonna make the films we wanna make. You know, our profit is, is ultimately productive for America. What's going in the classroom is not our problem. On the other hand, they were delighted to you know, seize credit when they saw a film-based curriculum as fundamentally unobjectionable and when it was getting praised in the press. So again, let me go up here. So this is actually part of the MGM House publications. Like every year, MGM would put out a, a yearbook of what it had done for the community. And this was featured large, um, you know, in, in terms of the shorts that it had created. You know, one of one of the things that it did was like boast of all of the shorts that it provided to Kaliher and the Rockefeller Foundation for the purposes of educating future citizens. So industry is really playing both sides of the fence. Um, so that is question one. Question two. Um, thinking about the economics of makers. So makers is a really funny thing. Um, and this is what happens when you get a whole bunch of experts in a room who are not talking to anyone else. Um, because as these Harvard guys, um, who are, you know, again, brilliant social scientists and psychologists and educators, they're starting to workshop the film in schools actually in Newton and Cambridge and Brookline um, throughout the 60s. And every time they go in, the teachers, you know, these nice like fifth grade teaching ladies are like, guys, this is great, but you really need to worry about two things. This seems really complicated and expensive, number one. And number two, we think this might raise some eyebrows among parents. We're not really sure how we're going to explain it. And, you know, the people who are designing the curriculum are like, no, 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 it's going to be great. It's not going to be any issues. Pay no attention to the man in the corner. Um, and of course, both things explode simultaneously. Um, and one big issue is cost. When it comes, when they finish the curriculum, it is the most expensive, most complicated social studies curriculum ever designed. Because when I say it's multimedia, I mean like truly multimedia. There are games, there's like a life-size seal puzzle. <laughs> there are, you know, like there are there are 54 booklets that go along with this. Each kid has, you know, seven or eight booklets. The teacher material alone requires separate training films. Plus the curriculum development team wants, in order, because they know this is going to be hard, they know the films are weird and disturbing and ambiguous. And so they want to make sure that teachers are going to be trained to use them properly. So they try to require like 40 hours of teacher training in order to make this happen. Um, they can't find a publisher. Nobody's going to touch this thing with a 10 foot pole because what does fifth grade traditionally teach in the United States at this time? That's American history. So, are you really going to oust American history for like weird films about the Netzlik and like baboons, you know? Like, it, people don't know what to make 
So they end up going at the end of the day with this tiny little fledgling uh, kind of curriculum development shop, educational development publishers. Um, and they simply don't have enough money to sink into it. So this is sort of, um, it's, it reminds me of one of these films that is, you know, gets glowing reviews and nobody actually goes to see. Um, Makos creates this enormous splash um, and it lingers for a long time in American schools because it really is an amazing curriculum, mm -hmm. but it's incredibly expensive. Um, and so most of the users of it, quite honestly, are private schools um, where you have, you know, enough investment in materials to get it or liberal leaning public school districts in well healed suburbs. And then there's also some penetration into the inner city in terms of um, sort of gifts or grants in order to purchase this very forward thinking curriculum. Um, in terms of the actual films themselves, they were largely purchased. And that becomes, again, a really big issue um, at this time. It was possible to rent them, but because the curriculum was so expensive, mm. it was limited to certain communities. Um, and that's another sort of interesting thing about the activist backlash, because in a lot of the schools, the activists were not actually people with children in the schools themselves. They were coming from the outside as part of a sort of more generalized frustration about the direction American education was going. Because remember, this is the same era where busing is taking place. So all of a sudden, there's a lot of discussion about who schools are for and what schools are for. There's This is the same time that uh, we're starting to have new conversations about sex ed curricula mm -hmm. entering schools. We're starting to have new conversations about bilingualism in schools and the Supreme Court has just banned prayer in schools. No longer is there like a 10 commandments slapped on the wall and every kid like taking a minute to pray after saying the Pledge of Allegiance. So this is a time of enormous sort of moral and ethical turmoil in terms of thinking through schools. And a lot of times these activists kind of jump on the train of objecting to makers because they see it as part of a larger declension in American education, that there's something about the Makos films that they really object to. Um, and it's interesting that you say this because it's really descriptions of the films that they object to because they don't actually watch the films. They can't actually see the film. So one exception to that is in Washington, D.C., where there is a reporter who sort of wants to make a name for herself. So she creates a kind of it's like a two piece show about how like what are kids watching in schools and she manages to get shorts mm -hmm. from the actual curriculum producers itself. No, it's interesting because a lot of the shorts she ends up showing um, as clips in this news story are actually shorts that ended up getting cut. So for instance, they had this whole unit on the son of people of the Kalahari that they end up getting cut, that they end up cutting because they're like, whoa, it's 1969. Do we really want to have a short of black men who are, you know, effectively undressed and hunting with spears, you know, in like going out into American schools in 1969? We think this is a terrible idea. Like, we don't want to perpetuate negative stereotypes. We think this is going to be way too hot to handle. So they kill him. Um, and yet it winds up in the news report as something that is seen. So, so visual media provides a particularly explosive and yet weirdly under, like it, it has the, all the power of gossip, um, but no, very few adults who are activists have actually seen the movies in question. Other questions? Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I have two questions. Um, one is very quick. Is it possible to see the MGM shorts and the Makos films? And if so, where? But I also am wondering if you think that these kinds of practices, these kinds of curricula, um, fluoresce, uh, as you would say, during moments of kind of pronounced media transition and social transformation, you know, this kind of 1930 moment and this late 1960s moment. And um, if so, you know, is that something that could be kind of plotted? 
I, that's a really interesting question. And I would say, you know, yes. Uh, Perhaps I mean, even as a counter model to the cyclical yeah, story. Of exactly. Time, I mean, right? as a short answer, yes. I think it's much easier to embrace these kind of multimedia curricula at moments where progressive pedagogy resurfaces and becomes enormously popular. And a lot of times that is that takes place in times of deep social change. Um, I think when you see curriculum and pedagogy particularly become more conservative and ratchet back are at moments of kind of unified fear. Um, you see that in the 50s, for instance, where there's sort of a reaction against progressive pedagogy. It's associated with communism. It's just, you know, people get very nervous and we need to, we need to have more um, top-down content oriented uh, teaching in order to compete. Um, and film is a tricky medium in the classroom in certain ways because it is rich with information and in some ways it delivers information very efficiently, but it's very hard to assess. Um, and often students don't glean as much from a film content wise as they do from a textbook page. And so in moments where there's a lot of emphasis on quantitative assessment, um, so here I'm thinking about the standardized testing regimes of you know the 21st century, which you guys all grew up in and experienced. I mean, everybody that like went through that. Um, if you're watching movies and interpreting them and talking, like how do you evaluate that? Like how like, it becomes a much trickier proposition. So at times when America is feeling particularly anxious, whether it's about its own participation in the global economy, whether it is about um, you know, some kind of international threat um, or internal or domestic threat. Like sometimes people ratchet back and it's not that they run away from screens, but they use screens in a very different way. The kind of, it, it, there's a lot less, dis, there's a lot less comfort with the ambivalence mm -hmm. that visual images like the ones I show brought. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember the first part of your question. Oh, just where can we can we see these films? Yeah, you can see them. Absolutely. They're you know, they're sort of around on YouTube. A lot of libraries still have makeup films. No wonder. That you can see. And then there are there are some odd collectors' websites like there's there's like Makos Online, um, where you can watch some of the movies. Um, and that's fun and weird. Um yeah. And then the MGM shorts, I they're a little harder to track down. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe the, main, the, the Rockefeller Foundation has most of the materials, but the guy to talk to would be Craig Crydell, mm. who's at the University of South Carolina, and he runs oh. um, their educational film kind of archive. But he is really the specialist mm. on the human relations film series, so if anybody has a collection of those shorts, he does. Let's, yeah. uh, let's do one stupid question, and I saw we have one from um, Justin here. That's you might, might want to go to the speaker. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess apologies for kind of half formulating question. No but, need to apologize. Yeah, my understanding yeah, of Ariella Azure and um, her ideas about this civil contract of photography, mm -hmm. civic spectatorship, is that she really differentiates between. Um, Kind of the the piece of subject yeah. of the photographs, those who are dispossessed, marginalized on the periphery, right? And then basically, kind of those of us in the left, um, who, um, and my understanding is that she's actually quite against this kind of um, formulation that photography can be used to stir empathy, this kind of Western humanist. Mm -hmm. um, like argument for the power of photography, but that instead, you know, it should um, make clear to us the ways that we are complicit in um, perpetuating dominant structures. So I guess I'm curious, like you mentioned really briefly, the Makos curriculum was sometimes donated to inner schools, um, just kind of like the particulars of where this is being utilized, mm -hmm. whether it's being utilized differently, perhaps and predominantly Black, you know, yeah. you know, like what was going on and how was it being used? How were teachers being trained? Um, because it does um, seem that the kind of empathy model is quite not, yeah, um, not very much what she's talking about. And it's and it's interesting. And I'm really glad that you bring that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a big range, and it's something these reformers, both in the '60s yeah. and then in the '30s, were highly conscious of. Um, and I'll give you an example of the Makos reformers themselves. So they were very worried that um, the empathy that would be evoked 
weirdly, like kind of weirdly colonialist. Yeah, and they spent exactly. a lot of time, they're like, oh my yeah. God, you know, we had one workshop and the teacher was like, let's send them care packages. I'm like, we have to figure out how to like present this in a way that they don't feel sorry for you know, that there's how do you encourage a kind of cultural cultural relativism but also like engagement on the terms of the people involved and they actually end up making a short um so the net select people who are filmed for this series they are reenacting to like complicate it and get really meta and weird they are reenacting many of the traditions of their but this uh, is common in documentary yes oh, very yeah. common yeah. and this is something that comes up also <laughs> in the documentaries in the yeah. 30s that get used in a lot of these classrooms mm -hmm. um and you can see it like in one um a kid's like wearing modern underwear there's like a yellow band-aid and like one scene and the fifth graders are like oh oh i see you know they're, they're like noticing everything so the makeup designers realize that they've got first of all they don't want to play into exactly what you're talking about um so they actually make a film about making of, the making of kind of film, um, the, the Netsalik here today, and then the Netsalik in the past. Um, and one of the other sort of interesting elements there is the Netsalik end up loving and being extraordinarily grateful for the Makos films because they see them as part of the legacy and embrace of their own tradition. They see this as sort of an act of preservation mm -hmm. of their own culture rather than an exploitative gesture. Um, so there end up being a series of films about not just the making of the film, but the use of the film and how to navigate these complicated discussions about race, anthropology, um, and I guess even maybe othering. Is, I mean, that's not the word, that's not the language they use in the 60s. Um, and part of the teacher training is showing these films to and, and anticipating student comments and students' tendencies to pity um, or distance uh, the subjects on screen rather than engaging with them on their own track. How do teachers, how should teachers handle it? And they show a range of possible questions that students might ask and a range of possible responses. Um, there's also, I mean, anthropologists themselves are generating these films and they too have a lot of takes on how the films get edited in order to ensure that they are as respectful as possible to the people and, and sort of capture the proper vision of the people who are, you wouldn't really say starring, the people who are um, whose lives are being represented. So these are issues that people have in mind, and they are wrangling with them in real time. Um, they're very explicit about that in the sixties and seventies, in part because I mean it's a moment in anthropology where people are wrestling with that in new ways. Um, in the thirties, there's sort of a wider range, um, in part because many of the films they're using are not documentary. Um, you know, they're, they're fictional films. And so the kind of empathy that is being unleashed is slightly different than what Azaleh is talking about. Um, but the documentaries that they're talking about and that they're making use of, um, they are trying to, again, engineer not, not the distance that comes with pity, but more um, an equivalency and a sort of sense of engage connection um, to reorient that relationship between subject and other so that it is, I mean, again, it's more of a mutual contract, I guess. Yeah. So Thank does you. that answer your question? Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Justin. Michael. So he actually, he noticed that we're running short on time. So he said, uh, and a little student asked a question. If you have one. Yeah. 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 How's it going? Uh, ah. the talk. Um, and uh, so this is a question of what your entire work meant about the, the case studies. So I'm interested as a three point your study, you saw the ideas of screen replacing features, uh, sort of like robotic teaching, and if it's seen as a dystopia or a dystopia, right? Um, I, I know at some point this kind of coincided like in the 80s with the idea of like new public management and seeing public servants kind of as providing a service that's homogenous or whatever. I'm interested if if this kind of translates into your suit 
to see the, the very last bit again. So, so I'm interested in this, if screens can operate in some way on this, on this discourse as homogenized thing, kind of public goods in some way. Um, so, I mean, in terms of screens replacing teachers, this has long been an undercurrent of discussion. Um, and it is not in the best interest of any producer of media to be like, yeah, we're putting you people out of business to so definitely buy our winners. Um, so usually they are sort of putting a foot in both camps, like, oh, it will enhance, it will complement. Under no circumstances will it replace teachers. And yet, if you actually read margin notes, a marginalia of letters or memos, if you, um, you know, over, if you read through the transcripts of these conversations where teachers are not present, um, that is very much part of the mix. Um, there's a lot of disregard and disrespect for what teachers do, particularly, particularly among technocrats um, who will often say, you know, the media is going to do an infinitely better job, you know, or the programmers will do a far better job of handling these issues, whether it's content advance or skills practice um, than teachers will. So why are we wasting money on these human beings? Um, so you see that prominently in the 1950s with educational television where people especially in the ford foundation which is what i talk about in the book they start touting this idea of oh, well why why would we rely on mrs humperdinkle to teach fourth grade music when we could get like the best of the best let's get leonard bernstein <laughs> to teach the fourth grade um Sounds like master class. It totally is. It's absolutely like that. Um, but you know, as anybody who had a fourth grader last year during COVID knows, um, sometimes you don't want Leonard Bernstein on the screen. Sometimes you want Mrs. Humperdinck with like the symbols and the you know the orf instruments. Um, there's a difference in terms of live classroom communication. Um, it's really easy to say that there isn't. Um, but I think that's where sort of educators, you know, emphasize it over and over again. And, and it's interesting because the development and the age groups, um, the conversation changes with age groups. People get more excited about the possibilities of screens replacing actual teachers in the later stages um, of education. I mean, nobody's suggesting that that is a good idea in kindergarten. Like everybody's like, ah, oh, it's terrible. Idea. But, um, you know, it's something that gets floated over and over again well, you know, a school might not have the, 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 the resources to hire a Mandarin teacher or like an advanced calculus teacher. So why wouldn't we use technology as a replacement? Um, and, you know, within the, like, I am, I'm not a sort of contemporary ed tech person. And here I feel like I should defer to Justin Wright, who is apparently in the audience. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not media can replace or can sort of supplement. Um, but, you know, even though every single media producer will absolutely disavow replacement um, in public, if you go into the archives in private, at least historically, there is far more discussion about the possibility um, of techno utopian replacement than you anticipate that you will find. Um, Thank you. Um, well, I guess we have run up against the time, mm -hmm. so we will stop here. Thank you again uh, for the wonderful talk and a great discussion. Thank you to everyone in the room and online. <laughs>